Well, welcome to Hope Restored. Uh, we're really looking forward to a great day to uh, service tonight and to uh, hear what it means to be have God confidence. So enjoy with us as we share this time together. there good evening and here is the very important notices of the week weekly services um, Kevin and myself we join the um, on Sunday City Life Church 
in Portsmouth. Um, we feel that's been a really good service the last few weeks while we've been on lockdown. Uh, they do a service 10.30 in the morning and 6 o'clock in the evening. So if anybody of you wanted to click onto that, remember that Sunday service. Thursdays, um, obviously we do this one that you are already on. Um, this service is Hope Restored. Um, we start at 7.45 and we normally finish about 9.30, but it's a really good service. So I'm hoping that you'll, uh, you'll see that if you're new here today and for those of you that have already been on. There's a group lunch times um, on the Thursday called The Vine, which is run by a lady called Diane. It starts at 12.45 till two o'clock and that again is via Zoom. So you're more than welcome to join that one. Please um, always, I mean, there are always, when I'm talking about these things, they're all on the screen. They should show up if Kevin's done his work properly. Um, if not, you can always go to the website, which is highway358.co.uk, and you will find all the details of the different notices on there. And then we come to giving. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much for any of you that have already given to this ministry. And this basically is for anybody that feels um, led by God, if they feel that they would like to give um, towards the ministry, then that would be great. Anything would be um, really appreciated. The, the details again are on the screen and or you can go straight direct to the uh, website and you can go via PayPal there. Thank you very much in advance. And now we've got something really exciting. We've got new Hope Restored YouTube channel. And for those, I'm, I'm basically usually probably know me. I'm not great with the uh, computers, but this is really, really good that we've actually got our own channel. It's called Hope Restored. Well, there's a surprise. So yes, Hope Restored YouTube channel. And you just, you can, again, you can connect through the website onto that. Um, so just and please if you can um, when you go on there could you subscribe it doesn't cost you a penny but it would help us with the numbers and it would look good as well yeah. thanks so much great to see you uh, enjoy the rest of the service god bless
sin No other name Jesus Jesus My heart will sing No other name Jesus Jesus My heart will sing No other name
just pray before we listen to this talk. Mm -hmm. Father God, we want to thank you for um, all of these messages that we're hearing uh, from Life Church, and uh, we pray particularly that this message would really strike home in our hearts as we uh, listen to what you're going to share with us through your word tonight. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, Craig and Amy and Cindy and I got together and had dinner. We've been quarantined and apart, and we're really, we love spending time together. We got to have dinner. We were sharing a meal, and we were reminiscing about when our relationship began um, 19 years ago. And Craig kept going on and on about, Pastor Chris, man, I just remember when I heard you as my second worship pastor, and you were just so gifted. And Cindy looks at him and said, really? And I'm like, yeah, really? And, and like, I, I know that's how we met, but I wasn't, I was okay. I wasn't super great. But in Craig's mind, I think he thinks I was much better than I really was. And that really has defined the nature of our relationship. Pastor Craig, if you're watching, I want to say thank you for always seeing more in me than I saw in myself. That's really a gift, you know when you see something in someone else that they don't entirely see in themselves. And that's kind of what today's message is all about. Because we all deal with some form of lack of confidence, a lack of inadequacy, a lack of insecurity. But there are other people somewhere, and for sure God, who sees in your life something that you do not see in yourself. For me, it doesn't take much. It could be a weird look that I'm like, oh my gosh, what, what, do I have something in my nose? Or it could be an awkward moment. And let's be honest, in the last couple months, there has been nothing but awkward moments socially. You don't know how to interact with human beings anymore. Um, it could be a weird uh, comment that someone said, case in point. Two, three weeks ago, I'm at Costco wearing a mask like many of you are wearing, and I'm, I'm just kind of like steering my cart away from as many people as possible, and this guy locks eyes with me and starts coming for me like this, just like this, and I'm like, this is too aggressive during a pandemic. That's what I'm thinking. And he comes up to me, and he's a close talker, no mask, and so he's leaning in, and he's like, Pastor, you preached a message a year or two ago that absolutely changed my life. And I'm like, why didn't you wear a mask in Costco, man? Like, I'm pretty sure it's required. But he's giving me a compliment. So I lean in, I'm like, tell me more. Just keep going. And he's like, I just can't tell you, like the trajectory of my entire life is different because of that message you preached. And it is just mind blowing to me that you almost died on vacation in Portland. <laughs> there are 12 of you laughing who know the person I'm talking about isn't me. It's my boss, the person that preached last weekend, Sam Roberts. Can we show some love for Pastor Sam? Did an amazing job. <laughs> Pastor Sam, there's a guy at Costco that thought you did an amazing job. And just a little comment like that, I'm like, you know, the insecurities just rise and rise and rise. Here's the thing, like I've got a long history with insecurity. I, I had terrible acne in high school. I had bad sense of style when I met Cindy. Uh, to her, I had what Cindy called summer teeth when we first met. What are summer teeth, you ask? Some are here, some are there. Some are pointing this way. For those of you who are orthodontists, bless your ministry. Um, even seriously, like today, I see on Instagram other dads doing grand adventures on the weekends with their sons, and I'm here on the weekends, and I feel like a failure sometimes as a dad. Um, my wife is a better student of the Bible than I am, and I'm the pastor and supposed to be the spiritual leader of my home, and the inadequacies start to rise. Let's be honest, church. Every single one of us lack confidence. It can take the form of the people pleasers, right? The people that just, that I'm, I'm just, I'm always sucking up to the boss or I'm always saying the right thing or I always want to be in your good graces. Or it could be the, what I call the fishers, those people that are always fishing for a compliment. It could be uh, the young lady that takes a makeup and, or no makeup, 
takes a selfie, posts on Instagram, all natural, just keeping it real, and she's flawless, and the ladies want to vomit because she's perfect, and she's just trying to get a, oh, girl, you are so hot. I promise you, today, I will leave this service and go home and say, Cindy, I just don't think my message connected with anybody. Like, I don't, I don't really think it just it changed anybody's life, and I'm, what am I doing? I'm just fishing for a compliment, a response, or the one-uppers, the person that has uh, the more important name to drop, they got a better deal on this, you know, we're just trying to, whatever that is, those are just mechanisms to deal with a disease that every single one of us deals with on some level or another. And it doesn't just make us feel bad, guys. It absolutely robs us from the life that God has created us to live. It's gonna lead you to not interview. Like, what's the point? I'm not gonna get the job anyway. I'm not gonna enroll in school. I'm in my 30s, everybody else is in their 20s. I'm not gonna get sober today because most likely I'm gonna pour a glass tomorrow. That's not a way to live. But these inadequacies keep us from doing the things that God knows are best for our lives. So here's the thing. If you get anything today, I want you to get this. We do not need more self-confidence. Here's what we need. We need to cultivate, and that word is intentional. We have to slowly cultivate God confidence. I don't need self-confidence. I need to find a way to live my life with a sense of holy boldness. Because why? If I place confidence in me, Jeremiah 17 says, my heart's deceitful. Why do I place confidence in a deceitful heart that is lying to me all the time, right? Jesus said it in the gospel of Matthew that my flesh is weak. I'm not gonna put confidence in a weak flesh. Or Paul wrote to the church in Rome, Romans 7, that my behavior is inconsistent. But look what King David wrote in Psalm 57. He says, my heart is confident in you. My heart is confident in you. No wonder I can sing your praises. Our lives have to flow out of a deep sense of identity, of who God is and who he says you are. And so today, I want to give you three thoughts, just three truths to help you cultivate a sense of God confidence. And I say truths intentionally. The reason we need truths to cultivate God confidence is because our sense of inadequacy is often rooted in what? Lies. Somewhere along the line, we have believed a lie, a deception about ourselves. And the only way to replace and battle those lies is with the truth of God's word, amen? Look at what Paul writes in Romans chapter 12. He says, and so look, don't be conformed to the pattern and the culture of this world, but instead be transformed. How are we transformed, church? By the renewing of our mind. How we do we renew our mind? It's because we replace the lies with the truth of who God says we are that which is good and acceptable and his perfect will. So truth number one, to cultivate a sense of God confidence. If you're taking notes, jot this down. My God is always for me. He is always for me. Some of you were like me and you grew up with this, this sense that God was constantly out to get me. He was always trying to catch me doing something wrong and smite me with his wrath. But that's not really the nature of God. For those of you who are parents, do you feel that way about your kids? Are you just sitting at the edge of your seat waiting for them to do something wrong so you can yell at them because that's the purpose of being a parent? No, we delight over our kids. We engage in the hard stuff because we want what's best for our kids. We want our kids to grow up to be people of freedom and people who know who God is and have a sense of, of steadiness, like their life is still water. 
And I'm just going to tell you, the most attractive person in the world is someone who knows who they are in Jesus. Have you ever noticed that? The people that we're just drawn to are the people that aren't really trying. They just know who God is and they know who they are in Jesus. I would, I would, even, I would even assert that being centered in your identity in Christ is the most powerful evangelistic tool you could have because you don't have to seek them out. They're coming to seek you out. They're going to wonder what is it that's different about that person that he is so steady when the world is going crazy. He is constant. I know who I am in Jesus and I know who my God is. This is what a a Christian life is supposed to look like. God is always for me. Paul wrote to the church in Rome, if God is for us, you've heard this verse before, if God is for us, it's not just a question, but a statement, my God is for me, therefore, who on earth could be against me? If my God is for me, cheering me on, thinking that I'm actually pretty special, who on earth? It's like, who cares, really? Who's against you? And I'm not even talking about them. I'm talking about you. If your God is for you, how could you not be for you? One of the greatest joys for Cindy and me as parents is watching Seth Beal play basketball. 16 years old, six foot four, brilliant basketball player. Cindy played ball in high school and we would go to his games, travel all over the place to watch him play. And I'm just going to tell you something about Cindy Beal. She's loud. She's, she's that mom. I'm just going to tell you, she's that mom. She would yell and cheer. In fact, the last season that Seth played, she actually had to make a covenant with herself to not address the referees. Am I lying? You actually did. I, I, I'm going to say something ungodly, so I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. And when Seth got onto the floor, Cindy would get noisy. And Seth would tell you he was embarrassed, but his play changed. His play changed. The ball handling changed, the aggression changed. Why? Because someone was sitting on the edge of the bleacher saying, I am with you. I am for you. You are not alone. I see more in you than you see in yourself. Drive the basket. Come on, post up. You got this. And your God is sitting on the edge of heaven doing that over you right now. Right now, that is who he is. We do not live our lives. Pastor Craig says this all the time. We do not live our lives chasing the approval of God. We live our lives as an overflow from what we already have. Not seeking something, but recognizing we already have the approval of God. My life will flow out of his approval. So do not throw away, the author of Hebrews writes in Hebrews chapter 10, do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. You're hoping to climb out of a mountain of debt, church. God is for you. You're trying to reconcile a relationship, maybe a marriage. God is for you. You want to start or feel led to start a new business. Your God is for you for you. You have to believe that. He is not trying to catch you. He is trying to compel you. Just live out of the approval of God. He is always for you. Secondly, church, my God always helps me. My God always helps me. Again, the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 13 says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with what? We say with confidence The Lord is my helper, and I will not be afraid. So here's the question. Where do you feel unsure? Where do you feel like you just don't have the tools to do blank or to be blank? In what area do you feel like, I really need some help 
here. Our God will help you. One of the most amazing things about this last season, as, as many challenges it has brought, it has brought relationship to the forefront. And the amount of intimate conversations that I've had with so many of you in our church is mind-blowing. And to hear stories of people meeting Christ when we haven't even had the building open for two months means the church is actually out there being the church. Neighbors having needs met, elderly people that are having cities bringing food to people in their 80s and, and speaking a prayer over them from a distance. Our God will help you in whatever way you struggle. And I'm telling you, the reason I, I mentioned the stories is that what he's done before, he will do again. And so all of the marriage that has already been restored doesn't mean that's where God's power has ended. That can actually happen in you. The mountain of debt that has been paid off already in someone else's life could actually be the story that God plays out in yours. The family member that still does not know Christ but somebody said yes to the Lord a week ago, well, that could happen to your family member as well. Our God is a God that stands ready to help. It is in our weakness, is it not? That his strength is made perfect. And let's be honest, some of you are having really challenging times right now. Tough. You will look back a year from now, two years from now, and you will see he was with you the whole time. And he was working in you in ways you, you kind of thought he might, but you can see in high definition later what he was doing all along. 10 years ago, January, my father passed away. And my father was one of the individuals that I spent my entire life trying to get his approval. And in the early days of us working out those teenage, teenager dad relationships, it was not great. Um, toward the end of his life, he was at his best. There is a softness in his heart. There is a, a repentance in his spirit for some of the stuff that he had done. And he ended his life closer to Jesus than he had ever lived it before. But I was asked to preach at his funeral. And I grew up Catholic. And so I was, I was freaking out. I'm in this cathedral in central Texas. And I'm walking up onto the stage altar area. And I've got a lot of um, just interesting baggage from religion growing up. And so I was very, I was just, I was very scared that it was not going to go well. And then the back doors of the cathedral opened and Terry Storch and Sam Roberts walked into the church. And they didn't say anything, but their presence changed everything. And I stood up with a sense of confidence and I preached my father's funeral. And there's something about presence that changes the atmosphere of your life. It changes the things you think you can face or things you can't face. And in fact, David wrote in Psalm 46.1 that God is our refuge and strength. Look at this, an ever-present help. I believe his presence is the help. He is an ever-present help in times of trouble. If you're finding yourself in a situation where you don't know what to do, what tool to, to use in your life relationally with conflict in your workplace, I got a tip for you. Invite the presence of God there. His presence is all the help you need. He is called, in fact, Emmanuel, God with us. Church, God is for you. He will always help you. And finally, I love this one. My God is still working in me. My God is still working in me. I, I remember um, when Noah Beale turned 16 years old, uh, he was going through the country phase of his life. 
And we've got lots of pictures. I'm not going to embarrass him with pictures. But it, every day was a Wrangler day. Every day was a Red Wing boot day. Every day was a, a Stetson straw hat day. Um, we were just, we were, we were full-blown country mode. Noah, what do you want to get for your first car? He'd been working his tail off and saving and saving and saving. I want a work truck, Dad. Of course you do. He wants a work truck. And so we start looking around for a work truck. Not only does he want a work truck, he wants a stick shift. <laughs> Son, are you sure you want to spend your life savings on something you do not have any experience operating? Yep, Dad, I'm confident that that's what I want. Like a 94 Ford or something like F-150. Anyway, so he bought a standard transmission work truck. And so it is obviously my job to teach this boy how to drive a stick. There's this, there's this give and take between the throttle and the clutch, right? What's a clutch, Dad? Oh my gosh, we're in trouble. All right, Th throttle and the clutch. So we go out into the country west of our house, way out there, nobody's around. Well, it turns out they're actually semis driving like gas and stuff around, which is kind of dangerous for somebody that doesn't know how to drive a stick. So anyway, we're doing this, and I'm telling you, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian man who's a pastor. And in the course of that hour, I lost my salvation seven times. I cussed more in that truck. He still does not want to drive me to this day. He has been scarred and wounded. So we get done. He, he figured the finesse out. But I got home after that whole thing, and I'm like, what is wrong with me? I'm a grown man who knows Jesus, I'm a pastor, and I act like a fool. Does anybody get a little bit frustrated that you are still struggling with the things that you're struggling with today? After all this time, after all that God's done, well, here's what I'm here to tell you. God is not done with you. He's not done. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is not done with you. Now turn back and say, that is a good thing. God is not done with you. I love this. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, being confident of this, that God who began a good work in you will be faithful and just to complete it to the day of Christ Jesus. He is not done with you. You are still a work in progress. I love that. Even when we blow it, God is still working. He's going to finish it. God does not quit. He does not get frustrated. He does not say, all right, I tried my best. I'm done. I'm going to wash my hands of all this. No, no, no. He's still working. And it isn't until we're in the presence of God. That's why Paul writes, until the day of Christ Jesus. You're not done until you're in heaven. And until that day, you're still a work in progress. So be patient with yourself because God is patient with you. You still struggle with spiritual doubts. God's not done. Nagging habit you can't overcome. God's not done with you. You've been neglecting his word. God's not done with you. He is not done with you. Here's the thing. And here's why this, this truth is so critical for us. Because if we continue to live our lives fueled by this sense of I'm not good enough. God made a mistake when he made me. It will render you completely useless. And yet the Bible says, God has a purpose for you. That's right. And your purpose is only as powerful as you living out of the truth of God's word. Some of you guys know my story. And this area of my life, I'm telling you, it is, this is probably the area where God has done a mountain moving miracle in me. I'm just going to tell you, there are still days that I struggle with some low level inadequacy and insecurity, but God has transformed me in this area because I lived the first part of my life until I was 28 years old, utterly paralyzed, needing your approval. I just need you to affirm me. I just need you to like me. I need you to celebrate me because I hate me. And some of you are right there. I spent two years out of ministry. I had like forfeited everything. My ministry was gone. My marriage was hanging on by a thread, all my fault. And I'm like, 
God, I just want to be free. I want to be free of these lies that I just am a mistake. Like everybody else got an aspect of your handiwork, but somehow I'm kind of on the scrap pile. That's the way I felt. And I'm working at a job at a home improvement store. I'm a lumber salesman. Nothing super exciting on the resume about selling two by fours. But there was the purity of that job that created an environment for revelation to happen in Chris Beale. And one day I'm working and I just feel the overwhelming sense of God saying, Chris, I love you. Like I literally heard it in my spirit. And I'm like, thanks. That's awesome. Appreciate that. And again, this moment came, no, Chris, I love you. And in that moment, what I have intellectually known my whole life, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, took an 18-inch journey to my soul. And at that moment, I knew I'm enough. Like if I never did anything other than sell two by fours, God would not love me any more than he does right now. And you may be in the bottom of the bottom, but your circumstance does not define who you are. And what, what, what I want to happen is I want a moment for you where you realize here, but you experience it here, that you are enough. The Bible says that you're more than an overcomer, right? By the word of the lamb and the words of our story that you're blessed coming in and you're blessed going out, that the promises of God are yes and amen for those who are in Christ Jesus, that you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. You are a co-heir of everything God created with Jesus. That is who you are here. But I need you to feel it here because it will change you and it will, it will render you dangerous spiritually when you live with that sense of still water. I don't need you to like me. God's crazy about me. Would you stand up to your feet for a moment, church? Even those of you worshiping with us on the website, YouTube, you might even consider standing as we, we're gonna worship. And here's why. Worship is warfare. When you declare in the context of God's people who he is and who he says we are, I believe that can be a mountain moving moment for you. I believe you can leave this place today different than when you walked in. And so we're gonna declare again a song we sang a moment ago. And I, want, I just wanna bring attention to some of the lyrics here because it's so powerful. Here I find your love is a firm foundation, so I'm holding on to the promise of your truth. And here's the promise, you make all things new. So your messed up thoughts, God can make your mind new. Your past that has defined you, God can redeem that and make it new. God is a God that makes all things new. And so I want us to lift our voices and let this be kind of a war cry and a line in the sand that I am not gonna live out of this inadequacy anymore, but I'm gonna live my life out of who God is and who he says I am. Let's worship him. Let's go. You remind me that you You never will, no, you never will. You are strong in my weakness, we say. You are strong in my weakness. I'm not lost in the darkness. Oh, you won't let go, you won't let go of me. And when my heart is angry, 
So Lord, we want to thank you that uh, you are always for us. Thank you that you're a God who is by our side, who never judges us, who never condemns us, but always wants to lift us up. Thank you that you're a God who helps us in times of difficulty, in times of weakness. And thank you that you're still working in us through these difficult times and in the things that we have planned in the future thank you that you are with us through those things and in those things and we pray father god that you would inspire us and challenge us to have more confidence as we walk with you amen i don't know about you but you know Certainly for me, uh, this rings a lot of truths. Um, there are times when perhaps we're trying to build our self-confidence instead of relying upon um, God and building our God confidence. So can you just explain it, perhaps from your experience, any times when you felt that way? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's one that I'm always learning. <laughs> You know, when I think back in my work life, it was it was that way. Um, you know, especially in your work life, because you probably feel that you need to have self confidence to do your work, and you need that self confidence to prove a point. Uh, but when it really comes to it, all you do is you stress yourselves out, and you and, and you and you get entangled in doubt. And I think that's the difference between self confidence and God confidence. Do you think it's um relevant to all of us then rather than just to people who are in the ministry i think absolutely i think uh, in all lives whether it doesn't matter what you're doing if you're trying to do it in your own strength you're going to come across this this stress that you 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 don't really need and uh, so i think it's, it's for everybody i think uh, it'd be interesting to hear what people say in in the meeting afterwards yeah, and I, I also think that there's a, a link here to what we've just been um, celebrating over the last weekend at Pentecost, that uh, it's not just about having confidence in God, but knowing that the Holy Spirit is within us and he is giving us the power to do the things that we need to do for God. Yeah, I, I think uh, I remember when I was working and I got so stressed and uh, the people, the people that were under me were used to say, why do you go out at 2 a.m.? I was a night worker. Why do you go out at 2 a.m. and walk around the car park? 
And, and I used to say to them, well, that's my way of just going and asking God, what have I got to do? Because I can't handle this. And, and they, used, they used to call it my, uh, my God walk. <laughs> Brilliant. So God is for us. Yeah. <laughs> and God helps us. Yeah. And God is still working in us. Yeah. And I think uh, as we have a chat about those things in a few minutes, it'll be good to see what other people think. Yeah. Um, but one of the final things I want, just want to say at this point is that for those of you who go to church on a regular basis uh, in normal circumstances and have pastors and leaders who you're looking up to, just bear in mind the things that have, been, have come out in this talk, that even those who are in charge uh, senior pastors, ministers, and so on, are struggling with these sort of things and feel at times that they're failures. And we need to get behind them. We need to encourage them. We need to uh, pray for them. So uh, bear that in mind as well as we come and have a, our discussion.